I will get started and people can come in when they do. And let me get the screen sharing started. Um, I'm uh, <clears throat> basically at this point, um, we're going to talk about thalamocortical dysrhythmia, but specifically, I'm going to be speaking about the ICA technique and the ability of the ICA technique to be used uh, to identify the dysrhythmia and um, the ability to target that dysrhythmia therapeutically uh, with either TMS or TDCS. So um, that's the the gist of uh, what the talk is about. And, and we've got people popping in. Um, uh, everybody's got to have a conflict of interest statement. Um, I'm the founder and chief science officer of Brain Science International. I consult on EEG morphology, and I'm totally dedicated to my dog. So um, those are my conflicts of interest. And um, I have to say, that the topic that we're looking at is very complex. Uh, this, this is just a diagram of how the brain is wired. But um, the APA wants a slide in anybody's PowerPoint that basically tells people that uh, they, they need to uh, be aware that not everybody is gonna necessarily have the medical or professional qualification to do everything we discuss. Um, you have to pay attention to what uh, part of this you've got credential for. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, T, uh, TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which at this point is still requiring in the United States a uh, psychiatrist to be on staff uh, uh, to, to basically manage the uh, TMS. Uh, internationally, that's not the case. Uh, you can be a psychologist in the Netherlands and in Europe and, um, and be able to do TMS, um, uh, but in the US, uh, it's still restricted to psychiatry. So uh, be aware um, that it's a complex issue and you've got to be able to uh, look at um, your uh, credentials. Now, uh, th this particular graphic was put on t-shirts uh, back uh, when I got it first. Uh, Dr. Lubar still has one of those t-shirts apparently. Um, uh, uh, and um, I then put it on the back, uh, uh, but it didn't have all of the neurochemistry uh, in it. I had to vector graph, uh, vector graphics so we could blow up, blow it up big enough. When this is blown up, it gets too fuzzy uh, to end up printing it. And um, so we, we vector arted it uh, with everything except for the names of the neurochemical pathways. Um, uh, so that this has come in handy. Um, uh, I, I uh, sometimes uh, pop this up just to kind of scare people at the beginning of a talk, uh, how complex things are. But uh, at this point, uh, uh, the world is complex. Uh, you've got to make sure your credentials match up with the techniques that we're discussing. Now, knowing about something that you're not credentialed to do is fine. Uh, doing it on the other hand requires a credential. So um, uh, uh, EEG is really a mess. Anybody that's looked at EEG very long uh, realizes that it's full of uh, subtle eye movements. It's full of dramatic eye movements. It's full of actual medical findings. It's full of artifacts like muscle and pulse and uh, movement. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a mess. Um, it's full of real and memorex, and the ability to separate one from the other ends up being important as critical uh, as, as a, a feature in order to actually do a good job of, of uh, analyzing. So to start with classical data cleaning, you cut out and throw away the artifacts. Um, however, there's newer methods using ICA uh, and, and other methods as well. Uh, uh, th this is uh, ba basically from 2010, uh, removing movement artifacts in a high density EEG recording during somebody walking and running. Now, you've got difficulty getting a clean EEG 
when somebody's sitting in a chair in your office. Imagine the artifact from somebody running and walking uh, with the EEG on. So uh, a tremendous amount of uh, artifact has to be cleaned up. Uh, and uh, people have uh, found the ICA to be an acceptable form of cleanup. Uh, not, not everybody agrees, uh, obviously. Uh, however, um, if you look at the publications in neuroscience, uh, ICA is pretty much ubiquitous. Um, real time uh, uh, de-artifacting during an fMRI using ICA to take out the fMRI pulse, but also things like eye movement and muscle. Now, uh, ICA is uh, relatively uh, newer. Uh, the older technique to cut out uh, major artifacts was classic, and we have to splice the ends together. Uh, we use a savitsky golay splice technique to minimize the artifact when you splice ends together that don't actually go together, uh, because when you make a cut in time, not all the ends you know, merge nicely. Um, and the Savitsky Gole is a really good job, uh, but it's not perfect. Uh, it induces a small amount of artifact. And if you have to do it, it's an acceptable artifact because that's the best way we can do it. But you don't always have to cut everything out. If you can extract something and eliminate cuts, you minimize the artifact induced by the, by the Savitsky Gole uh, low pass. Um, uh, th this is actually. Um, uh, um, online uh, denoising with eye blinks in EEG. Uh, this one was uh, actually uh, uh, published in, in um, uh, uh, a major journal, a clinical neurophysiology journal, with an impact factor of 3.2 or 3.4 or something such as that. Um, if you see people trot papers out, it's good to look at the impact factor of the journals that are publishing the work. If you have an impact factor less than 1.0, you have to think twice about whether the journal is actually an adequate journal to be publishing in. So um, uh, uh, Quinton and Louis are from Mencia in France. Uh, Jan Renard is actually in Apple now. He was with, uh, uh, with Mencia. Uh, De Kun Kim and Sung Wang Kang are the MD PhD uh, docs that run the Korean database. Obviously, somehow they had low standards. They let me into the paper, but uh, Marco uh, Congito, who's one of um, uh, Joe Lubar's star students um, uh, and actually started the Mencia uh, uh, group. He, he's a funded uh, researcher with the uh, equivalent of Bell Labs for the French telephone company. Um, and uh, we, we basically found um, uh, uh, solid evidentiary proof that eye blinks can be taken out with real time online denoising. Uh, this, this isn't just ICA, it's a little bit more complex than that, uh, but uh, um, uh, it, it's again a high impact factor journal um, and it's a publication showing uh, the uh, mathematical technical uh, uh, purity of the uh, denoising. Um, it, it, as a general rule, um, if you have a Gaussian distribution, principal component analysis is an adequate method for multivariate analysis. Uh, if you if imagine kind of a rugby football distribution, you know, thicker in the middle, uh, Gaussian distribution, but three-dimensional. Uh, it, it has a length and it has a width, and the PCA is going to find that. ICA, on the other hand, is appropriate for non-Gaussian distributions. As an example, ICA finds this, this, this distribution has a couple of uh, different axes going through it. It's not a Gaussian distribution. The PCA finds width and length. It does not find the actual axes that are in it. ICA does. So, uh, um, yeah, the uh, ICA is the preferred technique above PCA. And in 2000, 2001, when I lectured with Yuri, I asked him, are you using ICA to de-artifact eye movements? And he, he, he shook his head and said, no, we tried PCA and it just doesn't work. 
And I said, well, you should read this paper uh, uh, out of uh, Schwartz Computational. And uh, having shown him the paper uh, two weeks after that lecture was done, I received his software on a disk with an updated software with ICA built in for de-artifacting of eye movement. And uh, it works reasonably well. Uh, in the WinEG, it's not the best form of ICA. Uh, the ICA for de-artifacting of eye movement is called fast ICA. And fast ICA takes out the biggest component and sets it aside and then looks for the next biggest component. It doesn't do it in parallel, it does it serially. And by the time you've picked your top handful of components, which are fairly accurately identified, uh, the, the lack of um, uh, being done simultaneously, the last handful of components out of the 19 end up being pretty spotty. Their spatial uh, topographies aren't distinct or discrete. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're not, they haven't maximized the separation of components. Now, uh, built into WinEG is also Infomax if you're looking for the source of components. It, you do an Infomax uh, for, for identifying uh, spectral uh, uh, components. And that's a much better software package than Fast ICA. Fast ICA is used for de artifacting of major components of eye movement because it's fast, not because it's the best one, but it's quick. It's a quick and easy way to take some of them out. Um, Infomax would be a little bit more stable. It does everything in parallel, maximally separating each of the spatial and temporal patterns so that you get maximal uh, independence. Now, uh, there's even a better one, but it's not part of the WinEG at this point, and that's called Amica. It's an advanced mixture of ICA techniques. It's actually a, a multiple ICA techniques all kind of packeted together. And it's been shown to be very superior in the extraction of muscle. If you're looking for eye movement extraction, they're, they're all uh, pretty close to the same. Uh, if you've got somebody with very um, uh, well-controlled eye movements and the eye movements are down the list of components in the FAST ICA, it may not be quite as accurate as either of the other two approaches. If you're using EEG lab, MATLAB as a technique instead of WinEEG, obviously you've got all of the ICA techniques available as different modules within the uh, shareware. And I, I do appreciate the fact that uh, the uh, EEG lab people have freed up the, uh, their software so that people who want to embed the, um, the, the uh, EEG lab uh, modules into their own software can end up doing that. And you see that now some, uh, some people within the field of neurofeedback have implemented EEG lab, uh, MATLAB approaches uh, to uh, EEG processing and ERP processing within their software. And it's nice to have high level uh, academic uh, uh, um, developed software modules uh, that are uh, uh, being used commonly across the field. Um, so uh, um, uh, back, back to this, you know, um, we, we basically have lots of online denoising techniques that are out there, um, uh, uh, please, look to the impact factor when people are using uh, publications to support their arguments. Uh, if Again, if you have an impact factor of less than 1.0, uh, you, you've got to look twice at whether the journal's worth publishing in. There are journals that are considered predatory. When Martin Arns did his meta-analysis of the neurofeedback applications, um, uh, he, he basically uh, concluded that uh, unfortunately, the quality of the research has to meet certain standards for you to put it into a meta-analysis. If you put predatory journal material in, you can't get it published. And uh, he, he said, you know, there are, there are papers uh, that we can't use. And uh, he, he suggested that people publishing within the field look for high impact factor journals to publish within uh, so that they can actually use the, the uh, findings in a meta-analysis. So um, 
you know, ICA is generally looked at as something that can simply take out artifacts. When I handed Yuri the tool of ICA, I thought of it like a claw hammer. You could pull nails out with it, you know, and Yuri turned it around and used it to identify meaningful components within the EEG and within the ERP. And uh, actually that got him the Russian prize for science, kind of like the Nobel prize within the old Soviet Union, but within Russia, it's still uh, handed out as a, as a science prize. And uh, he, he got it for applying ICA uh, techniques, Infomax specifically uh, to, to uh, ERP and EEG. So uh, you can actually find meaningful components. It's not just with this stupid tech thought of you can pull nails out with it, you can de-artifact with it, uh, you can actually use it to identify meaningful components. And it, it's turned out that although we routinely use it for de-artifacting, uh, the, the fact that you can find meaningful components ends up being the important aspect to it. it it's uh, essentially a critical aspect and uh, you, you've got to have, uh, uh, you've got to have a, a good cleanup. Give me one second. I got some buzzing in here. So um, what we basically have is the ability to identify uh, specific uh, EEG patterns that are meaningful. Uh, you can identify uh, surface patterns as well as source analysis. And we we basically used this now um, uh, because you can look at source analysis very quickly. EG is quite useful for breaking apart the classic patterns seen in fMRI networks. Uh, what you see here in the right hand side of this, the metabolically fMRI identified resting state or default mode network, the brain at rest doing nothing. Well, hey, Jay, Jay, yeah. I'm not seeing your screen. Um, is that just well, me or is that other people? I just, uh, I can stop sharing and start it again. Yeah. Sometimes that clears it. Uh, yeah. No, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thanks okay. for the heads up. I, I don't want to just talk, uh, you know, on the right, you can see and you're looking, there's nothing there. That's no good. So um, uh, what you see, hopefully with my cursor going around it here, is the metabolically identified fMRI. Again, the, the bold signal, which is crudely equivalent to the slow cortical potential or infra slow content. You'll, you'll see a gigantic flare at PZ, the posterior cingulate. You see small ones in the temporal parietal junction area and a small one up front. Well, what you really have in EEG land where you can actually look at it millisecond by millisecond, not smeared across two to 10 seconds to create an image, but actually real time uh, is that for about 82 milliseconds, the brain holds a semi-stable state and it switches to the next one which it holds for about 82 milliseconds, plus minus four. Again, a little bit of time to switch, but it holds this pattern, which is the posterior cingulate off to the left side. And this is a bi-directional pathway. And it's not just alpha, it's also beta. And, and th this work is by Roberto Pascal Marquis, Dietrich Lehmann, who's passed, unfortunately, that he was the head of the Key Institute for Mind-Brain Studies in Zurich at the time. And they've got lots of uh, 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 colleagues working with them in Japan as well. Uh, so this is posterior cingulate to the left, posterior cingulate to the right, posterior cingulate to anterior cingulate. Both the posterior to the left and right are bidirectional with alpha and beta in it. Posterior to anterior is unidirectional, only from the back to the front. And it, it also has alpha and beta in it. And this is the posterior cingulate all by itself. So why is this a big flare? It's there all four times. The others are there one out of four. So this is big, those are small. If you model this network as though it has to all be there at the same time, you won't see it. It's 
you know, this, this is assumed to be a resting state, the brain at rest. But in reality, it's not at rest, it's twiddling its thumbs. It's going from state to state to state and back. So this twiddling of thumbs is going on, flip-flopping between segments rapidly. And when you smear it across time, it looks like this. So what you basically end up seeing is, again, the default mode or resting state network having a large posterior cingulate, smaller temporoparietal junction and anterior midline. And these are seen in this way because there's actually a dynamic going on within this network. This is not a truly resting state, resting state. Again, I, I describe this as the brain twiddling its thumbs. It's not sitting there doing nothing. It's flip-flopping between these four states back and forth, back and forth. So the microstate is held for about 82 milliseconds, plus or minus four. And if it's only 80 milliseconds, you can see that it's, it's a little faster than a 10 hertz alpha wave. So it's only there momentarily. And when you smear multiple seconds together, you lose the dynamic. You see only the static presentation of the bold signal. Again, alpha and beta, bidirectional, bidirectional alpha and beta, unidirectional back to front, and then push your cingulate all by itself. So um, this dynamic is seen with the EEG, not with the fMRI. And don't expect the default mode network to be there all at the same time, unless you're looking at it with time smeared. It's there in the same time frame but it's not actually there at the same time. These are subsets within, these are the dynamics within this network. Now, um, let's look at cross-frequency coupling. Uh, uh, Dirk's talk earlier talked about the phase amplitude coupling of infralow frequency to the oscillatory EEG. But here we see uh, approximately uh, 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 five Hertz, uh, this is about 200 milliseconds, which would be about a five hertz. And this is essentially on the surface scattergram. This is like a theta wave, uh, intensity drop, intensity drop. Uh, it's not a super stable, but it's generally somewhere in the theta band. And these are indwelling electrode recordings in the hippocampus septal neurons. Um, and here we see uh, a faster uh, pattern uh, developed. And uh, when you look on the surface, it's got a very fast pattern at about 100 Hertz. This is gamma nested in theta. The theta wave, when it's in its negative half wave, ends up with the gamma oscillating. So uh, cross-frequency coupling is how uh, neurons end up uh, actually working and doing things within the brain. And we, we have to be able to see that. So uh, what you see here, is, uh, and th this is uh, from Canolti, a pretty good source for um, cross-frequency coupling. Um, uh, this is a theta wave. And the phase of the theta, uh, and uh, here, a uh, this is like a lot of people who use an oscilloscope. Um, this, this is probably inverted. Um, uh, an EEG negative is up, but an oscilloscope negative is down. Um, uh, but the negative half wave of theta has a burst of fast activity. 40 hertz gamma, 100 to 120, 80 to 120, a faster gamma and ripples. Uh, you can see bursts of that happening, uh, again, with the phase of the theta. In the perceptual area, the phase is the, the uh, beta and gamma uh, are nested within alpha. There's an alpha wave, and you can see the nesting of the faster frequencies within the, uh, uh, the negative half wave of the alpha. So... Uh, the infralow frequency is, a, again, a modulation. It's the on and off of uh, uh, the, the uh, activity in general. The whole EEG is nested in the phase of the infralow frequency, but the theta and alpha are carrier waves 
that end up having the faster frequencies present in them. Now, cross-frequency coupling, when it's real, the, the, the gamma and beta occur in brief bursts called chirps. And these are called nests. Sounds like a bunch of bird brains, doesn't it? Um, the, uh, the nests are full of chirps. Well, uh, what happens when pathology happens? You know, um, th this is a normal control individual. Uh, there's a 10 Hertz alpha, and there's a little bit of faster activity. There's a little bit of cross frequency coupling between 10 and 20, the harmonic of the alpha. Um, but a bispectra should basically show 10 is hooked to 10, 20 is to 20. You know, we should see things on the, on the diagonal. Uh, but when you have uh, on, on the lateral, when you have multiple frequencies available, that's cross frequency coupling. And uh, the, the, again, the alpha probably has a harmonic uh, at, at a doubling of the frequency. But this is a patient, a Parkinson's patient. And uh, the, the, this is uh, one of the original uh, uh, studies by uh, Rodolfo. And um, uh, he identified uh, this as a phenomenon early on. And what we have is cross-frequency coupling between a little bit of a slowed alpha probably somewhere down around six, seven and faster activity. It's, it's coupled by looking across, you can see all of these frequencies are linked together and you get this gigantic flare in the, in the uh, pattern. Now, behaviorally, a Parkinson's patient has neural networks that become frozen. And when they're frozen, it's a neural network that's been locked on. When a neural network is formed, gamma emerges as a brief burst. In certain pathologies, that gamma is persistent. And this was one of the first uh, thalamocortical dysrhythmias to be identified was in Parkinson's disease. Again, a slowed alpha uh, cross frequency coupled with fast frequencies. So, you know, it, uh, an interesting uh, failure uh, with, within the neural networks and it turns on the gamma. So it's a relatively persistent phenomenon, the beta and gamma. And this doesn't go up into the higher frequencies, but um, what you basically see here is the uh, clinical group. When they grouped together all sorts of patients that were patients, uh, averaging them together, they saw cross-frequency coupling expanded. This is just all the controls averaged together. And again, you see activity on the 45 with some simple harmonics from the alpha. So um, the cross-frequency coupling is apparently something that can identify pathology in the brain. It's, you know, all patients average together, apparently it's one of these foundational failure modes. Now, um, uh, obviously uh, Dirk's group, and I, I don't want to take this and focus on it because Dirk got an entire talk about this, but um, you have to realize that uh, um, uh, the machine learning algorithms can identify this dysrhythmia blinded. I mean, it's not somebody looking for it and seeing something that they project into the data set. This is identified by uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning. And uh, um, th this was a 50-fold um, uh, uh, machine learning algorithm, but it identified slowed alpha down at about six hertz or so, surrounded by gamma. So I'm going to stop the screen sharing for just a second and turn on a different kind of screen sharing. Welcome to an episode of Bad Art. Uh, we've got inputs into the thalamus, two separate inputs. And this, this could be a somatosensory, this could be auditory, uh, this could be um, uh, any input coming into the thalamus. The thalamus has outputs uh, from the, the nuclear body that it's in that go to the cortex. If this input is lost, if it's deafferented, we lose this input to the cortex. 
this thalamic column, if it doesn't have an input, slows. When this column slows far enough, down to about six hertz, what happens is that it turns off lateral inhibition and you see a donut of gamma surrounding it. It's lateral inhibition that's been turned off. This is the invasion of, of basically uh, uh, phantom pain, phantom sound. Uh, tinnitus is a phantom sound phenomenon. And again, if you lose the input and it slows to about six and it's surrounded by gamma, that's the dysrhythmia. So the software was looking for a slowed alpha at about six and the gamma was identified um, uh, with the Hilbert transform because it's an easy way to see fast rhythmicity. And basically if you had a Hilbert transform gamma surrounding a slow feature, that was the dysrhythmia. What was surprising is that the same failure mode identified tinnitus, pain, movement disorders, and depression slash reward deficiency issues. It's the same exact kind of failure uh, with a different network. So let me get rid of the bad art and go back to the major screen sharing. So um, uh, what they found is, again, a primary uh, form of uh, pathology in the brain that's connected across multiple systems. In fact, you could have tinnitus in the auditory integration area, pain in the somatosensory, movement disorders in the motor strip, and in the uh, the anterior and, and subgenual cingulate, you've got depression and reward deficiency. So I'd like to focus on this uh, as, as, as what we're looking at for our next uh, piece, because depression is something that has TMS and to a certain extent also TDCS being used clinically. And um, when when we can identify blindly depressed people uh, at a better than 80% accuracy, uh, the, the rest of these were over 90% accurate. The, uh, the depression is probably not as accurate because of the DSM. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a homogeneous uh, a pattern. Uh, and again, it, the, the, the computer system, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithm found this location. So every spot in the thalamus goes to a spot on the surface, uh, obviously lateral geniculate uh, for primary vision, uh, medial geniculate for auditory relay into the auditory cortex, which is kind of enfolded into the temporal parietal junction. Usually don't really see auditory activity right here. Uh, it, 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 it usually projects up towards the, uh, uh, towards the top of the head which is where you see auditory event-related potentials, SCZ, uh, because it's, it's on the temporal parietal junction on, on the inside here. And it's uh, when, when it's is, you know, folded up next to the brain, uh, it's actually kind of buried in it. it. It vector points the discharge up towards the top of the head from both sides. So when you look at uh, Yuri's uh, ERP stuff and you see auditory being picked up at the vertex, go, well, that's not the auditory cortex. Yeah, but that's where the auditory cortex is pointed for your ERP. And classically, uh, brainstem auditory event-related potentials are measured at CZ. So um, uh, it, we start out with uh, sensory systems in the back of the head, uh, and that's uh, primary sensory relays. The pulvinar and uh, the lateral posterior nucleus are sensory integration areas. Uh, the, uh, the sensory input, uh, the motor regulation, the premotor, the, the cingulate, and the frontal and anterior cingulate. So, uh, and then central median ends up having uh, the, the, the temporal and limbic structures hooked to it very, very tightly. So, um, when we see something in the front here, it's not exactly a posterior sensory relay. Uh, 
if you see alpha up in the front somewhere, it's not a, it's not a sensory related uh, feature. It's projected from uh, other nuclear bodies up to the front. Uh, if, the, if it's in the cognitive division, uh, you're more likely to be anterior nucleus. If, if it's all the way rostral or subgenual uh, cingulate or the uh, frontal pole, um, you end up having a medial dorsal. So, uh, and this is just the left thalamus. You've got a right thalamus. Um, it's a, a little false because this is the left thalamus and this is the right hemisphere's inner surface. So, uh, uh, but the, uh, the, the two thalami are uh, basically wired up about the same. So um, let's look at TMS. First of all, uh, uh, if you're going to be doing TMS, you better have a pretty good wallet. Uh, $250,000 to $500,000 to be set up with the, the big boys, the, the, the more expensive systems, uh, the classic uh, Neurostar or the uh, classic Brainsway device, uh, $250,000 on up, depending upon what all you get. Um, you can lowball it for about $100,000 with, uh, uh, with other uh, corporations' uh, products, but um, you, you basically have a 1.5 to 3 Tesla coil that's going to zap the brain with an electromagnetic pulse. And you can either excite the brain with a faster pulse, like 10 hertz or faster, uh, or you can inhibit activity with a low frequency, one hertz pulse. Now, interestingly, they don't look at the EEG. Uh, if the person has a 12 hertz alpha peak, the classic 10 hertz does not really excite. One hertz always inhibits. 10 hertz is, you know, according to the books, it's supposed to excite, but it doesn't always. 15 hertz, 18 hertz, fast, that always excites. If the alpha is fast, you've got to speed up the stimulation from classic 10 hertz to a faster frequency. If you don't look at the brain activity and classically they do not, you don't know that. So, uh, and you, you won't know if there's a beta spindle on the right that you should inhibit, or if this is just that left frontal classic uh, uh, target for depression. Now in TMS, there's different kinds of coils that they use, a figure eight flat coil, which is just for surface cortex. It doesn't shoot a deep pulse. And these pulses can actually create an action potential. They can force you to have a discharge. And uh, they'll, they'll find the spot that makes you wiggle your fingers and move forward from there, or find the spot that makes you wiggle your toes and move forward from there. Those are biobehavioral markers. And again, flat coil got surface. Now, you can have a double cone coil and shoot a deeper pulse. Double cone coils are good to get to the insula or to the anterior cingulate. Uh, but a flat coil doesn't get deep enough for that. And then there's an H coil. An H coil is a much larger coil. It puts out a much larger field. It puts out a deeper field. Uh, and it, but it's also a lot less specific for where it's going to activate. So instead of targeting something very kind of, you know, hot spotty, um, uh, that, that this has a broader uh, field that it generates. And the H coil is the uh, coil used in the Brainsway uh, device out of Israel. Uh, the double cone coils and flat coils are uh, more common from elsewhere. So what can you use TMS for? Well, depression, but they base that on the DSM. They don't look at the EEG. Classically, they do 10 Hertz and they find the, what they call beam F3. Actually, BEAM is Brain Electrical Activity Monitor. It's an old EEG machine based on PDP computers and uh, approximately a million dollars to operate. It had to have air conditioned static control. I mean, it was, it, was a, uh, uh, it was an EEG, QEG device, but very few people had it because it was impossible to pay for and run. So uh, BEAM F3 is still where they're trying to find now we measure for F3 very easily. They have all sorts of bizarre ways to get there. 
most of the time what they do is they find the spot at about C3, which will make you wiggle your fingers on the opposite hand. Uh, and then they move forward from that about five centimeters. Uh, the fourth year of the Clinical TMS Society had a presentation from Harvard, and they said, you know, for some of you, the big head, that five centimeters might not be enough, and for a small head, it might be too much, you might have to do proportional measurements, like EEG has been doing since 1948. So, um, you know, they're still looking for the same spot that we find, basically the F3 location. If you find the proper location, Martine Arns has shown that you actually get a cardiac deceleration if you're on the right spot when you pulse it. And so they've got that as a biobehavioral marker as well. So 10 Hertz at F3 or with an H coil, they kind of point it at the left frontal area and they use an 18 Hertz, which is gonna activate it. Now, depression isn't always left frontal alpha. That's essentially the assumption of, of this. They're, they're targeting to excite the left side. Well, if you've looked at enough people with depression, you're highly likely to have an asymmetry, you know, in dominance up front, but it could be beta on the right just as easily as, as it would be alpha on the left. Now, this, the approved uh, process for the FDA says, start on the left and do 10 or faster. And if you have a side effect, you might try some one hertz on the right. Basically, if you have an agitation or mania, induced by the left side stimulation. I suggest looking. Yeah, you know, my grandmother said, don't dive into the water unless you know what's under the surface. I think it, it is quite apropos for uh, the, the use of uh, EEG for TMS. You know, use the EEG to look what's under the surface. And if you've got left frontal resting state, fine. If you've got right frontal beta, you know it's there. You can target it. You can split your sessions on stimulation left and inhibition right. But it's not everybody that's got this left frontal or right frontal problem. There are people that actually have it on the anterior cingulate like Dirk found in this. So they're missing this entirely. And if they don't know that's there, they can't point it at it at all. Now, more recently than depression, OCD has been approved. Now it was approved in Europe before it was approved in the US. Um, uh, so they find the spot that makes the toes wiggle basically around CZ somewhere. And they measure forward again, five centimeters and the same thing. It might be too far, might not be far enough. It's a standard measurement. It's, you know, it's, you don't have standard heads. You should basically be uh, looking for the anterior aspect of the cingulate. And when people do this measurement, they usually end up somewhere in the FC or AFC location. It varies because again, head sizes vary and it's a standard size. And the, the OCD you know, approved approach basically does 10 Hertz or 18 Hertz to excite the anterior cingulate. Well, we know because we've looked at with the EEG, not everybody has alpha or theta failure modes up front you might have a beta failure mode in OCD. And if you do, these are a real mistake. You're gonna excite something that's hyper excitable. So if you actually look before you leap and you look with the EEG, instead of being blinded like the FDA uh, cleared protocols, which are symptom driven from the DSM. And I don't think I need to rank on the DSM anymore. Pretty much everybody would chime in. Yeah, damn the DSM, you know, but. Um, it, it's basically still being used clinically. Um, people still want us to address, you know, are we effective with this DSM category when the category is no good. Uh, but um, uh, depression isn't all left frontal alpha. It's not all right frontal beta. Sometimes it's at the midline. If you look with the EEG, you can differentiate them. OCD might be theta, might be alpha, in which case exciting it will probably help. If the alpha is faster than 10, it won't work. It's gotta be faster than the alpha. Uh, so, and it has to be the right, the right coil. You can't hit the anterior cingulate with a flat coil. You have to have a double cone or an H coil. So the, this is kind of the limitation of the FDA uh, for approved protocols. We actually found somebody who was complaining of depression who had an anterior cingulate feature 
we referred him with the information that the anterior snake out was the problem to a TMS practitioner who was on the TMS Clinical Society Board of Directors. He's obviously very, very well known. Um, uh, I knew him really quite well. I, I was on the planning committee for TMS Society for five years. So uh, we referred to him and he said, well, we were restricted to the FDA approved protocols. So although they knew it was at the anterior singlet, they did 36 sessions of beam F3, 10 Hertz to no avail, not one iota of improvement. You know, that's expensive, it's time consuming. And, you know, at, if, if you're shooting at something with your coil that doesn't exist, it might be a waste of time, an expensive waste of time. Uh, and we actually gave them kind of a map as to where to shoot and what to shoot with, but they, they, they were restricted by their compliance to the FDA cleared protocols. Now, I would suggest uh, that you actually pay attention to the data. Now, this is just a diagram of the kind of data I'm gonna show you. Uh, this is the surface topography of the component. We're gonna ICA the compose the EG into components. Now you don't have to throw away any components. You can just go straight to the ICA and leave the eye movement component aside. Don't use it, uh, but don't take it out. Leave the EG as intact as you want and you find a component that you want. Now, this component isn't necessarily one, it's just, it's just a demo, uh, but you can see uh, colors are polarity uh, and this is uh, 2.6% of the variability of the EG. And this is the spectra of the component. So it's at this location with this spectral content, some five, some uh, maybe seven, eight, not much beta, just you know, mostly slow. This is the time course, the scatter plot across time. So if it was a burst of something and then nothing, and then a burst of something, you'd see that dynamic across time. Um, and then uh, obviously the Loretta from dead center on the most intense area. And Loretta is supposed to be low resolution, but this is kind of picking the hottest hotspot all the way on out to a broader and broader and broader area. And they'll identify Brobman areas, which are you know, obviously uh, structurally unique uh, with the cell structure and everything but they're not independent one of the other. Uh, they're, they're integrated into networks. Um, it'll have a general description of the area uh, and the lobe that it's in. So uh, medial frontal, uh, uh, precentral, postcentral, paracentral, and cingulate. And then you see the, the, the 3D and 2D uh, uh, presentations of the Loretta solution. So this is what's going to be done. Um, and uh, when you do it for an EEG, you can find components that are meaningful components. We're not taking artifacts out with ICA. Uh, you know, again, my, my simplistic idea of what it could be used for when I handed the software to Yuri, or I handed the idea to Yuri by, by giving him the paper, I thought of it as a de-artifacting technique uh, but it can be used to find meaningful components like this component. Now, this is a thalamocortical dysrhythmia in a depressed patient. And what we have is a rostral anterior cingulate location, like Dirk identified within his paper in depression. Now, it's not a beam F3. This is basically the midline. When you look at the source analysis, it's anterior cingulate, subgenual, uh, a little surface frontal as well. So rectal gyrus, uh, medial frontal, anterior cingulate, medial frontal, um, orbital. So uh, that, that's the spot that we've got. But look what we have for a frequency. Here's five hertz, probably for that, six hertz perhaps for that peak but we have other faster frequencies and they happen at the same time. They have to dance together somehow or they'd be in separate components. So the component analysis has 
said, yeah, it's not just this five, six, it's all, this, this component also has this approximately 20, which is not a harmonic of a 10, it's a separate, uh, a separate 20 hertz rhythm. Um, it has a separate 25 to 30 hertz rhythm and something all the way up at the higher frequencies as well. So multiple frequencies, cross frequency coupled within the component. Again, if, if they weren't dancing together, if they weren't coupled somehow, they'd be in a separate component. So this component isn't a big one. It's only 5% of the variability of the EEG, but it's a clinically relevant one because it shows the dysrhythmia. And it points directly, it points directly where you would target um, your, your TMS target. It's not the cognitive division at FZ. This is actually an FPZ or an AFZ uh, target. It's further forward. And uh, you can point your magnet at that and actually uh, pulse it. And 10 would do because the primary low frequency is slower than that. Um, and, and it would, would basically break up this pattern. Um, so, uh, um, you know, if you're shooting beam F3, assuming that the left frontal is going to fix this patient, this patient doesn't have that. This patient has the thalamocortical dysrhythmia marker at the anterior singlet. Now, what you see here is polarity, the color's polarity. And if you go hot to cold, hot to cold, um, uh, basically, um, uh, imagine it as iron filings uh, on, on the surface, just the, this big field of iron filings and this big field of iron filings. Well, it's not the either end of the magnet that, uh, that's putting out the field, it's the magnet, the source. So when you, you, you end up looking at a pattern like this, hot, cold, hot, cold, we got a source you know, somewhere at the frontal midline skewed to the right. And that's basically what you see as skewed to the right. So, um, you know, if you look before you leap, uh, don't dive in before you actually look what's under the surface. You can see the pattern uh, to target. This is a dysrhythmia, and it gives you a really quite direct target for TMS. Now, um, the fact that it has a theta peak uh, also suggests that this might respond to ketamine or one of the dissociatives. Uh, MDMA, uh, DMT, psilocybin, etc. cetera. Um, theta at the anterior cingulate is a biomarker that those tend to respond positively to. And we'll, we'll look at that as a feature in just a little bit. First, let's look at a classic beam F3. This is component number one, uh, the beam F3 left frontal source of alpha is the largest component and it's over 30% of the EG variability. So this is a gigantic feature. Uh, it's primarily the alpha, it's got a little harmonic in it, uh, but this is basically alpha. There's little moments where the alpha quits, probably some dips in vigilance where the alpha turns off. But um, when you look at it, this is the beam F3 classic target, the left frontal and inferior frontal, inferior from middle frontal gyrus is what they usually describe it as in the TMS groups. Um, but uh, uh, this is a classic beam F3 target. Um, 10 Hertz is faster than the peak. It should work. Um, 12 would work, 15 would work, 18 would work, um, but faster than 10 basically. Uh, uh, 10, 10 or faster. In this case, 10 is slightly faster than that peak. Um, so uh, they would basically point a figure eight coil or a double cone coil if you want, but figure eight will hit this. It's right on the surface, surface cortex. And uh, you activate this area and it breaks up this idling rhythm and you activate it. Now, if you did a follow-up EEG, the component that makes this uh, should respond. And instead of being component one with 30 something percent of the variability, 
usually we'll see this drop down in the Kimon order if it doesn't disappear. It generally drops down before it disappears. The percent variance will uh, be what ranks it higher or lower. Uh, but uh, if, if, the 31% of the EG variability coming from alpha at F3 isn't the normal uh, person. This is a, a significantly depressed individual with a classic left frontal alpha, not the thalamocortical dysrhythmia, again, fast content and slow content all coming from the anterior cingulate. So um, I mentioned theta. Actually, uh, they gave ketamine to a bunch of normal people, healthy, normal people. And they basically found that theta coordinates drops down. Now, <laughs> I, I'd ask if anybody knows what coordinates is, but uh, the, usually the answer is pretty much no. I would give maybe two or three people uh, in the group uh, half a shot at knowing that coordinates is uh, absolute power, relative power, uh, 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 being uh, similarly in the same direction as coordinate. If uh, absolute and relative power are not in agreement, then it's not coordinate. So it, it, it's a complex relationship, but it basically looks at theta at the frontal midline. Uh, and uh, it predicts basically that uh, the antidepressant effect of the ketamine is to break up this theta coordinates. What I would suggest is that they basically didn't look across the frequency spectrum adequately. And uh, what you're going to see is a change in um, the dysrhythmia. Um, ketamine actually produces fast activity about at 30 Hertz. It's not like 40 Hertz. And instead of being at layer three goblet cells, which make uh, the, the, uh, the, the gamma at 40 Hertz, uh, this ends up being um, a, 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 the goblet cells here, uh, basket cells uh, uh, for the, the uh, classic uh, gamma at 40. So, but it, it's somewhat like stimulating something. And ketamine, um, when given, uh, it's been our observation that theta at the frontal midline, which we use as a biomarker for pro providing the ketamine, the ketamine jacks up the theta dramatically during the experience of the ketamine, but it extinguishes it after the experience. So the fact that the that the the uh, the fact that the uh, that the theta coordinates drops uh, ends up being what we basically see, not with theta coordinates, but with uh, re regular power and cross frequency coupling. Uh, again, the theta ends up being an indication for the cross-frequency coupling. Now, uh, TDCS, um, uh, 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 thalamocortical dysrhythmia, targeting for TMS, uh, has been patented. Now, they didn't just patent it for ketamine. They patented it for the use of TMS and any hallucinogen whatsoever. I mean, they got a whole list of them now. Um, but what you basically see is that they patented it, but these kind of patents fail on challenge typically. In fact, 75% of all patents fail on challenge. Uh, what they patented was not using a DSM to, tar to, to, to uh, target the TMS, but using the DC, the, using the thalamocortical dysrhythmia to point the magnet. So if you see a dysrhythmia, now, if you see it in the auditory cortex, you, as Dirk does experimentally before he implants a stimulator to turn off tinnitus more permanently, he'll pulse TMS and uh, see if it influences the intensity of the auditory uh, uh, tinnitus. If it reduces it even very briefly, it, it's a, a strong indication that the implant will end up working. So um, it, you can use uh, the dysrhythmia to target the TMS and point it at the appropriate cortical location for pain, movement disorders, depression, et cetera. And obviously at the frontal midline for uh, uh, people that have uh, reward deficiency syndromes. 
Um, now, um, obviously, I have to thank Dirk for, well, uh, all of his foundational work on uh, thalamic cortical dysrhythmia, uh, Dr. Kropotoff for all of the uh, software assistance and um, uh, the uh, uh, kind of touching up uh, some of the uh, pieces that go into the display that we're using. Then obviously uh, uh, Dr. McKaig and the Schwartz computational folks and, and the clinical TMS uh, society. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, don't think you're getting away that easy. I've got um, a bit of a talk on DC STEM to provide as well uh, uh, here. And I think I've got uh, uh, another, uh, what, uh, 30 minutes maybe? About so, 25, yeah, you have about 25. So um, I'll, I'll get through this and, and leave time for questions. So uh, first of all, transcranial direct current stimulation is essentially, uh, you can use a simple battery um, with the uh, wires coming out of each end and the plus and the minus go on the surface. If you use a 1.5 volt battery through regular skin impedances, you'll probably have crudely a tolerable current, but you know you shouldn't just go tossing together a 1.5 volt battery and some wires uh, with sponges and uh, uh, do it yourself. Uh, the TDCS devices are cheap. A couple hundred bucks gets you something out of China. Uh, 350, 400, 500 bucks gets you a very well constructed device out of, uh, for instance, Dave Sievers group and Mind Alive. So find yourself a professionally produced one that does current limiting uh, circuitry so you don't end up frying somebody's earlobe or something. Um, but DC stim is very cheap. If you look at the quantitative mapping of how many studies have been done with DC stim, it's gone up exponentially in the last decade. If you're a grad student and you don't have the funds to pay for the MRI time for fMRI studies, maybe the DC STEM device for a couple hundred bucks will be provide you something that you can actually get your PhD with and afford it. So there, there's a lot of people doing DC uh, uh, research. Is it new? No, it's not really new. Um, it, it's, it's been around for a long, long time. How long? Well, when Claudius Galen and Pliny the Elder were using it back in the, you know, the early years, um, it goes way back. Now, they weren't as, you know, fine and you know, uh, advanced as us. They used a slimy fish. We've gotten rid of the slimy fish and we use slimy sponge discs. But basically, we're not that much further advanced than they were. Uh, it's, it's still a crude technique to excite or inhibit uh, cortical areas. Now, luckily uh, it's contingent on what polarity you're using. If you have the anode, the plus electrode, you excite cortical function. If you use the cathode or the minus electrode, uh, you can inhibit cortical function. And it lasts across time from the time of the stimulation uh, to the time it goes away. As the longer the session, uh, the, the longer the effect, uh, the more intense the stimulation, the longer effect. But at, there's some point at which the stimulation becomes uncomfortable. Um, if you turn up the stimulation, it will become painful and eventually damaging tissue. So you, you want to limit your current density uh, so that you're not baking the skin with electrical currents or um, anything such as that. At the point at which the person can barely feel it, you're, you're at an appropriate level. You don't need to, it's not a no pain, no gain circumstance. You, you wanna have it so they can barely tell it's on. Um, if you can feel it strongly, you're getting a skin effect. It, this is too much uh, back down the current density. Um, and and uh, again, the polarity determines whether you excite or inhibit. Um, changes the excitability of the cortex contingent to the polarity. Again, same basic finding. Yeah, let me get this projected instead of just in front of me. Um, you can excite uh, uh, ERPs and ETs. Um, 
if, if you put it on the visual system, uh, you can get more gamma and beta out of the cortex from the anode. If you put the cathode on, you can dial down the cortical excitability. You can make more alpha, less gamma and beta with a cathode. You can make less alpha, more beta and gamma with a anode. So the polarity that you're using ends up influencing what's done. Now you might say, well, you got to put both plus and the minus on the head, don't you? Uh, sometimes you put one of them on the shoulder as a non-cephalic reference point. You have to have both of them on to pass current for it to work, but you don't necessarily have to put both of them on the same, on the same you know, head. You, you, you can put one on a shoulder, the other on the head to complete the circuit. Um, uh, animal stimulation, basically, uh, they, they can enhance memory consolidation during sleep, uh, which if I would have known that uh, back in the university days, I would have gone to sleep with a battery on my head, you know? Um, uh, we've got uh, obviously changes in somatosensory uh, sensitivity. And, and if you're working with somebody who's got pain, you should look at this and go, oh, I can dial down the excitability of the somatosensory cortex with a DC cathode. Um, if, you, if you've got somebody who's got pain and they have beta on the somatosensory strip, they have sensory sensitivity, give them a little cathode stimulation at that beta spindle, dial it down the excitability, it'll help. Uh, I see we've got a possible intervention for restless leg syndrome. Possible, um, restless leg syndrome is generally uh, associated with a dopamine uh, issue uh, in, uh, um, uh, somewhat similar uh, actually in the medications that are used for restless leg with the uh, meds that are used for Parkinsonism. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you can excite or inhibit the cortex. And at this point, uh, applications are largely experimental. Uh, I don't know that there's a, uh, a solid uh, agreement um, uh, the, yeah, that, that uh, something is specifically uh, clinically uh, useful. Uh, there are um, studies on stroke. This was hemophilia neglect in people that were, had a right hemispheric stroke and uh, they, they had hemophilia neglect to the left side. Um, th they were treated with a DC stim uh, their uh, function improved to the point where they were able to pass their driving test. Now, I don't know if I want to go driving in St. Petersburg now, but uh, <laughs> uh, hemophilia neglect is a, a dangerous thing if, it, if it's there. But if you treat it effectively and you can pass the exams to drive, I guess you're a driver again. Um, I, I can't drive anymore. So. Um, a lack of speech. Um, you know, this, this was actually a, an early project that Yuri did. Um, they, and uh, here we'd probably consider these um, uh, on the autism spectrum, uh, lack of speech in an autistic kid. So uh, they, they advertised, you know, that when Glasnost uh, happened and they actually had to uh, uh, do something for a fee instead of just having a a position paid for by the state. Uh, they ended up with clinical work they needed to do. So they did a, a nice piece of uh, research on uh, people who couldn't speak. Uh, the parents brought their kids in for the sessions. They'd stimulate and uh, they'd go back to the car, go home, come back for another session. After one session, uh, the parents went out to the car, turned around, came running back in. Oh my goodness, little Johnny is speaking fluently. Uh, he didn't speak at all, and now he's speaking fluently. And they said, well, that's good. Um, uh, once we've started it, uh, we don't need to have you come back and continue. Congratulations on the effective you know, uh, outcome. A couple of weeks later, the, they brought the kid back and said, you know, can you turn it down some? You know, the, uh, the, not not uh, everybody's happy with uh, speech that's finally induced when, it's, when it becomes excessive. So. Um, they, they turned it on. Uh, you can modulate things, but once you initiate them, they're there. Uh, depression, uh, th this is a left-right frontal balance. It was ongoing when I created this, but the study's done. 
they found it to be uh, uh, generally clinically effective. The plus electrode on the left side to activate, the minus electrode on the right side to deactivate, and um, uh, it, it, uh, it improved depression. Uh, cognition, this is the sleep study where they stimulated the frontal lobe and had enhanced uh, uh, semantic and declarative, uh, excuse me, uh, enhanced memory uh, consolidation. Um, epilepsy, that's an interesting one. It's both a, a contraindication to doing DC stim as well as an indication if you know what you're doing. If you're not somebody who works with epilepsy, uh, don't be doing stimulation technology on somebody who's got a discharge. The same thing with TMS. If they got epileptiform content, it's not safe to do TMS. You can actually induce a seizure. Now they're rare, even in known epileptics, it's very seldom that anybody's been triggered, but it only takes one. So uh, let, let's, let's be uh, cautious. And if somebody has epilepsy, uh, uh, make sure you've got somebody who's an expert in treating epilepsy with stimulation technologies. Uh, don't, don't jump into that deep end of the water uh, by yourself as a first, uh, first application. Um, peripheral issues, they actually do DC stem for bone and tendon growth. There's a lot of people that have a cast on their leg that have a built-in stimulator inside the cast. So uh, it's a long time ago, but there was 1.5 million web bits on direct current stimulation. But you know, it might have been a million of those that just responded to stimulation. So we we don't really know. Um, so um, uh, they they use uh, stimulation for enhancing uh, motor control in a stroke. There are people that are doing um, a random uh, noise stimulation to enhance sensory perception. There's all sorts of kinds of stimulation now not just TMS and DC stim. There's also ran, uh, the uh, random frequency um, uh, stimulation uh, and, as well as uh, pulse DMF. Uh, I haven't talked about pulse DMF. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, one of the newer uh, applications. The FDA approved it as a device primarily because it, they thought you couldn't do any harm with it. Um, it, it was a, a way to stimulate the brain uh, but it, it can't evoke a potential. You can't make somebody wiggle their fingers or toes. Um, as far as they're concerned, it wasn't something that could actually do something to the brain. But we know better than that. We've seen uh, uh, pulse DMF uh, 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 induce harmonics within the brain, uh, excite activity, inhibit activity, uh, similarly to other stimulation technologies. Um, uh, but it, it, uh, again, it's not uh, directly part of this. It's a relatively newer uh, technology. And the people who use it are uh, kind of slowly creating um, a, a kind of a field guide as to what different kinds of stimulation do, why you would select a, a one hertz or slower versus uh, some other frequency. So um, they're, they're still, as clinical groups, kind of pounding around with the new hammer they have to figure out what kind of hammer it is and what it can be used for. Uh, so uh, uh, Pulse DMF isn't the uh, primary purpose of this talk. Anyway, that's what I have for the chat. Um, and it leaves us a few minutes for discussion and stuff. So uh, have at it. Anybody got a question or a comment? Uh, Sal put a question and um, Cindy has her, oh, is clapping, but Sal had a question uh, that he put in the chat, chat, do you, uh, chat, do you want to Sal? <laughs> Sal, do you want to say your question? Okay. You and... oh, oh, hi. Hi, Jay. Great talk. Um, I have, a, the question I have about TMS is, uh, in any STEM technologies for that matter, uh, are they a reflection of multi-channel limitations when addressing left frontal alpha? I don't know that I caught your question. Uh, run it by again. Okay. Um, what I'm wondering is, uh, 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 is uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll frame the question a different way. 
uh, it, it does it, the emerging uh, st stimulation technologies uh, are they reflecting limitations of multi-channel uh, Z-score Loretta neurofeedback uh, targeting uh, attenuation of left frontal depression, where where you have where you have high amplitude of alpha, suggesting that the the generators may be fixed, and the only the only way then that you can target and attenuate that that clinical feature w is is either medication or uh, a, a stem technology. Well, uh, uh, obviously, pharma targets ligand gated ion channel uh, uh, to control a neuron. Uh, DC stem, AC stem, random frequency stem, TMS, neurofeedback, all of those tap into the voltage gated ion channels. Uh, they're different control mechanisms over the same cells, basically. Uh, it, 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 uh, as uh, uh, as they say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And that might sound really cruel, uh, as though we're actually skinning little kitties, but skinning, skinning a cat actually refers to driving a bulldozer, uh, not uh, skinning little uh, furry creatures. So it, there's, there's a lot of ways to change something. Uh, Z-score training, uh, power spectral training, stimulation, TMS. Um, you know, uh, uh, pharma, there's a lot of ways to, to, to regain control over a system. Um, it, it, as an example, we, we usually describe uh, the, the phenotypic uh, implications for pharma and the phenotypic indications for uh, DC stim, mag stim, uh, nerve feedback. Uh, and, and we give the client the choices. I mean, ultimately, they get to choose what, what therapy they want. Uh, we can point to the options for them. It's like a box of chocolate with a back poked out of all of them. With, you, know, you can see exactly what's in them. You get to pick which one you want. You don't have to eat the maple necessarily unless you want to eat the maple. Um, you, you get to pick which therapy uh, uh, will work. And the EEG, QEG um, assessments help point to the options that end up matching well with the with the path of physiology. You know, the DSM doesn't really guide you for therapy, no, no. unfortunately, but uh, we, we have good guidance based on the EEG, QEG as to what your treatment options are, both with medication and with neurofeedback and neuromodulatory techniques. Yeah, I, I would like to add to that, that sometimes it's, you know, it's the luck of the draw. If, if someone is ready to be, you know, to learn how to self-regulate, it, it, there could be, a, you know, whatever the modality is at the moment could be the thing that puts them, you, you know, in the right step. Um, there's another question here from Bridget. Um, she appreciates how informative it is. Do you know where we can reference to additional training in TDCS, um, I, I just wanna say that um, we have an amazing uh, course through the Behavioral Medicine Foundation continuing education course that Jerry DeVore teaches that really goes into all of the dif different stimulation technologies. And he's a great researcher and a great skeptic. And so um, he doesn't, he doesn't, it's not an infomercial for these kinds of things. He takes it quite seriously. and. Uh, as well, um, he teaches for us at Saybrook. So if you really want to get really comprehensive in your in your training, you should look into Saybrook University. <laughs> yeah. And those uh, are APA accredited courses. Yes, absolutely. They're, they're, they're not um, yeah, they're, they're not little fly by night things. You get credits and all that stuff for it. Yes, and Bridget, I'll put a link in the chat. And then Taylor had a question. Taylor, you want to? You can just talk because they'll hear you through here. You, we don't have to go through that. Okay. Uh, just let me know if I sound too quiet. Um, so uh, basically when I'm playing with alternating current, I slow it down to be DC. So in 10 second increments, switching back and forth, going from FPZ to OZ. And I was curious if you think that that actually could stimulate the thalamus. Well, if you stimulate the cortex, you're probably stimulating the thalamus in some fashion too. You know, uh, if you're changing alpha, 
you're changing thalamocortical columns and it's a thalamocortical thalamic uh, network. Um, so if, if you're tapping into that network and you're changing it, you're working with the thalamus. You, 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 the thalamus is, is difficult to see for surface EEG, but you see the alpha and you, you've seen the graphic. I mean, all those nice colors for different spots pointing to what spot in the thalamus was working. I mean, um, uh, the, um, it, it's, it's been a long time uh, is, is, uh, back when people first thought that the thalamus was a source of alpha. You know who postulated that first? Berger. I mean, it he, makes sense. He, he, he stuck a, an insulated uh, uh, probe with just the tip exposed in and he basically found some relationship between uh, thalamic activity and the surface EEG in animals. This wasn't his son, you know. <laughs> uh, he found the EEG in his son, but they didn't stick the, the, the needle into this in the kid's head. That said, um, uh, Berger was uh, sticking thermometers into human brains that were alive. Uh, he was a Nazi, he was a nasty guy. Um, uh, we have a terrible early history. People have tried to cover over the fact that Berger was a Nazi. He was a Nazi, face it. We got uh, the, the concept of EEG would have been found by somebody else who so it wasn't have been Berger, uh, but uh, Berger gets credit for it. Uh, thank goodness uh, a bad person can find something good once in a while. But uh, he, he was a Nazi. Um, uh, there's, there's a current book called The Electric Brain, uh, uh, by uh, Douglas Field, uh, who, who wrote The Other Brain about uh, Glia. Uh, he actually went to Germany to Jena. Go to Jena, you won't find like the lab of Berger with a big historic thing. In, in Germany, if you're a Nazi, they don't celebrate your history. So you don't expect to go to Jena and find a big deal about Berger's lab. It's, it's you got to search for it. Um, actually, they're you know, they found uh, a, a journals um, a written by him, uh, his, his personal diary, basically, complaining about uh, Jews on the beach ruining his vacation. I mean, you know, again, uh, you, you can be a really bad person and stumble on some good things. Apparently, that's what happened here. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would urge you to read the book. Uh, it's actually a really interesting book. Um, uh, the, the author actually had his EG recorded. Um, we go over his EG QEG with him. He does a little bit of neurofeedback. He had a low voltage fast EEG, uh, which gives you some idea of what his first feedback session must have been like, uh, a busy brain. But he also talks about brain computer interface in the book. Um, it's, uh, it, it's well done. Um, uh, and it's a good read. I mean- Douglas who? Douglas Field, R. Douglas Field. It's called The Electric Brain. And there's probably not a whole bunch of those uh, that are current books. I've got a couple copies of it sitting here. I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I got one from the publisher and one from Dr. Fields, who didn't know that I got one sent from the publisher. So, anyway, I've talked around whatever question that was. Um, Um, yeah, thank you for that. By, uh, by the way, you, you, you did talk about slowing down AC to the point where it becomes DC. Um, <laughs> the, well, at some point, if you slow something down so it's not alternating, it's direct. You know, uh, you have a plus and a minus. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, it, uh, it isn't just uh, the slowing it down, it's actually transforming it to being just DC. Uh, if, if you do just DC, you have to realize you could polarize your electrodes. You can also polarize the skin. Um, if you have the right kind of electrodes, you don't worry about polarization, uh, but uh, uh, be aware. Um, a DC uh, done for a long period of time can actually plate metals into the skin. Uh, so you don't want to end up doing uh, DC current stuff any longer than is necessary. There are people that like the effect and want to do it for longer periods of time. Uh, in, in Yuri's lab, uh, they found uh, the left frontal uh, anode stimulation and, 
and uh, right frontal cathode stimulation. And the, the person who tried it really liked it. Now he was a bit depressive and he found that it was a very good effect. So he thought, well, you know, a little bit of something is pretty good. Let's try a lot of it. And he hooked himself up and he kept it on. And he ran long, long, long session. And he flipped from depressive to manic. Uh, which was productive for a short period of time, but you can't run mania very long before it ends up running into the wall. So um, you, you, you know, do DC stim to activate or inhibit, but uh, you know, don't, uh, don't send the customer home with a DC stim device without some counseling about overdoing it because uh, too much of a good thing isn't a good thing. For sure, yeah. Well, I guess we're at time. Any other last minute questions before we uh, take off the book for lunch? I had a quick question um, <clears throat> regarding uh, TDCS in improving speech, that what, what you were talking about. Was that placing um, an anode in, at Bro in Broca's area or in let's say Broca's aphasia, something like it, that? It, de it depends upon what's going on with the speech on the individual case. Some people have speech motor okay, but they can't find words and their working memory is not good. And that's not Broca's area, that's an associated area that's important for speech, but it's not Broca's area. So you need to look at the individual's brain activity and their symptom presentation to know exactly what aspect of their speech process is actually not working. You, you have to be able to comprehend speech in order to execute speech. So if it's a very young person who's having trouble with speech, they may also have receptive difficulties. Mm -hmm. you know, if you learn a new language, you can understand what you're hearing before you can speak it. So the, literally the posterior sensory stuff is important as well. They used to have such a strong separation between Wernicke's area and Broca's area. And, you know, first of all, don't stick your name on something. For God's sakes, there's perfectly good anatomical names for those locations. Would it Wernicke conquer it and stick a flag in it? You know, uh, you climb a mountain? No. Uh, uh, get rid of the excess names, you know, especially if you got a name like Wernicke or Hjorth, uh, for, uh, you know, so they're, uh, um, and just a little bit ago, uh, when Joel was talking about the T6 area and things that were hooked to it, he mentioned Wernicke area. Well, on the left, I always joke about Wernicke having a sister who studied affect and have the same name on the same spot in the right hemisphere. It's just a joke. There's no Wernicke on the right hemisphere. So, uh, although I'll tell the joke, nobody laughs, you know. <laughs> well, I thought that there were homolo homologous um, uh, structures, you know, when you have yeah. some kind of a, um, um, a lesion or whatever, that the, that the opposite side will develop to some degree to compensate. Yeah, but Wernicke's name didn't get stuck on anything on the right side. Uh, okay, well, so. sure, that makes sense. And, and, and it, there's actually a newer term called Wernicke's territory because it's considered to be such a big area that's all around yeah. uh, language language comprehension that's <laughs> kind of interesting yeah i'm surprised that they didn't call it the united states or something you know <laughs> I, I, come on you know get uh, uh, use anatomical structural names that way you don't have to have some bizarre history lesson as to who conquered what when um but you know they used to separate you know, receptive from expressive, and uh, they're all integrated. Mm -hmm. um, it, they network together. If you don't comprehend speech, your speech isn't going to be that good either. So, um, and you know, uh, you you can have them both goofed up uh, by a process, and it's hard to separate them out at that point. Mm -hmm. When my father had his subdural hematoma, uh, at, at first, I when I spoke to him, I thought it was a stroke. But then over a little bit of time, it became obvious, no, it's not, it's not that he can't understand me at all. And it's not like he can't speak at all, but all of that, that was messed up. I mean, he, he wasn't fluent. He didn't really fully comprehend. And you, you kind of get an idea of what areas are involved in that. And I came up with the, pretty much that entire side of the head. And sure enough, that's uh, his subdural hematoma was 160 cc's that occupied the entire side of his head. 
um, luckily it, it drained out um, and he, he recovered nicely. Uh, that, we, that was written up as serendipity in the subdural hematoma and uh, in biofeedback. So anyway, uh, that's what I've got for you. And um, I guess you're all gonna have to catch a lunch break and uh, power yourself back up metabolically so you can end up burning more calories, focusing your energy this afternoon. Yep, very good. Okay, so we'll meet back in an hour, which will be 10 minutes after um, our time, one o'clock. Thank um, you, Jay. Oh, sure. And whatever time, 10 minutes after whatever time zone you're in. I just do this for the fun of it, you know? And, and uh, as Cynthia knows, I don't get paid for these. Uh, Cynthia is good enough to donate whatever she would have paid me, pittance though it may be, uh, to some student fund somewhere. And students always get the pittance anyway. So uh, that's that's one of the many things I love about you, Jay. Thank you. <laughs>